Hello, everybody, wherever you may be from coast to coast and see the shining sea. Welcome back to Ham Radio Live. Thank you so much for coming. Today's the 8th of August, 2021. Back in the saddle again. We're going to talk about the technician exam today, how you can get into amateur radio and get licensed. Yeah. Hopefully a show that will help you get on the path to get your license and get yourself into ham radio. What do you say? Let's get the show to go. And away we go. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Shack in Oregon. It's great to see you. Happy Sunday to you, wherever you may be. Gosh, it's a pleasure. Happy Sunday to you. And uh, my gosh, the house is already filling up. Look at this. Two continents here so far. Juliet, seven to Ishmael. I call him Ishmael because, you know, IMS. That's Ishmael. He's in Dominica. Ishmael, welcome to the show. It's great to have you, my friend. Hope things are going well with your tower antenna project and amplifier you're working on. That's great stuff. And um, I always think antenna first. If you can get the antenna first, especially directional, go that way. It's good. My brother Bob, courtesy of WIFI. Welcome, Bob. It's good to see you. Happy Sunday. Andy Cowley from the UK is in the house. Good to see you, Andy. Stephen Bengry from the state of Texas is here. Hello, Stephen. Welcome to the show. Kilo Delta 8, Foxtrot, Quebec, Lima. All right. We've got a good show, a good group today. It's pretty cool. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Wow. It's truly a pleasure to see you. It should be a fun show today. Hopefully to, uh, excuse me, help some people out to get licensed. Just a second. That's the hope. Um, we're really hoping to get you licensed. Now, to help you on that path, first of all, I want to tell you, next Saturday, this gentleman here, Steve Deans, he is the owner and the founder of Alpha Antennas. He made the brand new Hex Tenor. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. I'll show it to you. I'll talk about the testing so far, and we'll go into it. This guy is phenomenal. What this is, and I love, is the fact that it's easy, and it's really effective. So, man, wait till you see it. If you'd like to get into amateur radio, the main purpose here is to help you to get into amateur radio because, you know, there's lots of YouTube shows that show you products and do different things. Our goal here is to help you get an amateur radio. So the ways to do so, first of all, is contact a national radio society. Maybe it's a, you know, ARRL or maybe it's people in Great Britain, they're RSGB, but contact a society that specializes in amateur radio, okay? The American Radio Relay League can be found at www.arl.org. If you're in the uh, UK, you can contact the Radio Society of Great Britain at www.rsgb.org. Over in Canada, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, www.rac.ca. In Japan, the Japan Amateur Radio League at www.jarl.org. And our mates in Australia, Wireless Institute of Australia, www.wia.org. The next thing you want to do is Find an online course. Now, many countries have their own. Here in the U.S., we've got the American Radio Relay League. It has a great way that you can get some distance learning there. Also, Ham Test Online. This is the one that I used. Went from zero to extra in one sitting. They have a 100% guarantee. If you fail the test, it was phenomenal for me. I was blown away by the success I had using this. My father-in-law used this, hamradioschool.com. He loved it. Worked well for him. Went from zero to general. So it depends on what you like. Most will have a free trial. Also, Ham Prep. Ham Radio Prep is a great source for you to find your way into amateur radio and study for your test. If you'd like to email the show, maybe you have a question about getting into ham radio, please reach me at Gmail. My Gmail address is ham, sorry, CQ ham radio live at gmail.com. If you'd like to help out uh, with financial resources to help us just get this dog on tower on the roof, we would appreciate it. Find me at PayPal at proverbs356 at me.com. It's a uh, Basically, the antenna itself is more like a, if you remember the Glenn Martin antenna masts that were about six feet, they are, you know, come up on four legs from your roof. That's exactly what it is. The problem is no one's making them anymore. Can you believe that? It's unbelievable. Let's say quick hellos. Lots of folks have come in and my goodness gracious, I, I'm really stunned. It's Sunday and here we are. And ladies and gentlemen, it's a very special moment because from the German frontier, he is here and his name is Gunter. Gunter, RF Roll. Welcome, buddy. Good to see you. Always a pleasure, man. That's great stuff. Wow. Great to see you. Look at this. We've also got Tom 
from an airport, most likely in Bulgaria. His call sign in U.S. is Alpha Echo 1 Tango Papa. His Bahrain call sign, Alpha 92 Golf Whiskey. Welcome, Tom. Thank you. Hope we're making your airport stay a little better than watching airport TV, right? <laughs> Ishmael got a spider beam, 40-foot mast. That's a great antenna. Wow. Congratulations on that. From Saskatchewan, we've got John Hummel Newell, Victor Echo 5, Julian Hotel, November. Official Victor Alpha 3, Delta Lima Oscar in Canada. Welcome to the show. Wow. It's an honor to have you, mate. Thanks for being here. I mean that sincerely. Wow. Hey, my man Ron's here. Victor Alpha 3, Fox Street Union, Charlie. Ron, Thank you for coming. It's great to see you. It's like old home week here. Sean Casey is here. You're going to be a ham. This show will help you, Sean. It's about the first level license and how to get in, what you're going to get, and studying. So hopefully it'll be something that will help you, okay? First of all, a few bits of news and information, all right? ARL now providing a free RF exposure calculator to check from your antennas to make sure your neighbors are protected from radio frequency, you know, basically exposure so rf you know, rf exposure the maximum permissible limits will be calculated within this calculator i'll have it in the description section of the video in rs sorry in arl news the Bovey island expedition if you've been following along here for the last year it's been off and on off and on well they're still trying for the 2023 de expedition to Bovey island Bovey, the reason why this is so important this is called the 3y0j de expedition it's because it's the second hardest island to get in the world. That's why. So they're trying really hard to make this work and, you know, make it work with the weather because Bovey Island is literally between South Africa and South America near Antarctica. So there's only certain times a year you can go. We wish the very best. Nigel Jolly and the group there that's putting that on. That's a, that's a really brave and very hard island to do. Also, you can nominate someone for the Golf 5 Romeo Papa Trophy. You can do this. They're taking, the RCB is taking your um, suggestions no later than Friday, September 10th. So mail it to this email address you see here on the screen, and you can nominate someone for the G5RP trophy. Chapels on the Air going to take place on September 11th. Most of the activity on the 80 and 40 meter bands, side bands, going to happen between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. in Great Britain. So essentially that's going to be, you know, 10 UTC to 16 UTC. Find them on 40 through 80. Should be a neat little thing. Bletchley Park, by the way, this is huge. National Radio Center, Bletchley Park. I told you on, on uh, Saturday or Friday show, whatever. It's been a while. Friday show, I guess. About how many people have been coming to the Bletchley Park complex? This is such a huge historic place. Go there now while you can. If you're in the UK or you're planning a trip, don't put this part off because this is true history going back to World War II. What they accomplished at Bletchley Park is unbelievable. But please make sure to follow social distancing rules and wear a mask, okay? Also, in the RSGB news, in July, Steve Golf Zero Foxtrot Union Whiskey gave a talk that covered the history of amateur radio exams in the UK, as well as the 2019 exam syllabus. You can find this, by the way, on YouTube and search for Bath and District Amateur Radio Club to view the video. This is really good for UK viewers, okay? Also, the next QSO Virtual Ham Expo is going to take place in the UK on the 14th and 15th of August. Tickets include entry for the live two-day period as well as the 30-day on-demand period. Access to the exhibitor area is free but does require registration. You can purchase tickets and see a complete list of over 90 different speakers on the RSGB website. That's pretty cool. Got a trivia question for you today. So far, North America with one, and that's it. We're just doing months. North Korea, remember what? They won Jan, you know, July, but we'll see who wins this. In what year did Samuel Moore apply for his first patent on the printing telegraph? Now, keep in mind the question. In what year did he apply? Okay, for his patent on the printing telegraph. Don't give me the year he got the patent, okay? So is it A, 1837, B, 1844, C, 1849, or D, the printing telegraph was not patented by Samuel P. Morse? Hit me up with A, B, C, or D, and you will get it correct, all right? Solar conditions powered by ICOM. ICOM, for the love of ham radio. Here is your solar corona holes. You can see there's quite a few, 84, 85, 87, and 88 on the solar 
face right now, but nothing really causing any issues. The A1A, pretty quiet. You see a little spot there in the northwest corner. We do have a little bit of a solar number, but there's not many bright spots. That's the whole point, all right? Solar flare detection has been pretty quiet. No B-class flares even over the last three days. So we've got a real stable geomagnetic field from the sun. The KP index, so this is the geoplanetary field, you know, the magnetic field coming from the planets, has been quiet. We've got a good K1 right now, and it has went as high as K3, but really been very, very quiet. MUFs around the world. Alaska is 15.98. Boulder, 14.89. Out of Brazil, we have a 16.57. Ascension Island, getting a little dark, going to go down a little lower, 15.78. Hermana, South Africa, 9.40. Darwin, Australia, wake it up at 11.11. Jeju Island at 9.80. Current conditions out there. SFI of 73. Look at that solar number of zero again. Remember, it was 34 on Friday. Now it's zero. It's because of the way that the A1A looks. See, there's just no bright spots. So that's why you have a solar number of zero. A index is 11. K of 1. We have a solar wind of 363.5 kilometers per second. Four meter E skip open right now. And you can see the condition is not very good. And that's because we've got a 73 for a, you know, a solar number in SFI. Not too good. Cuban jamming still going on. 7.105, 7.115, 7.126, 7.131, 7.141, 7.151, 7.158, 7.161, 7.179, and 7.216 megahertz. Take a look at this. Here is what 7.158 and 7.161 look like, okay? See, they're literally right next to each other. I Sorry, seven, I meant the 7.131, 7.127. They're just literally blanketing most of the lower part of 40 meters. Not very good. Forecast, Parabiacom, Hammond Radio, and Shortwave. The best in products for either one. You can find them at icom.us. Sorry, icom. Uh, dot, uh, sorry, icomamerica.com. My goodness, it's Sunday. Forgive me on that one. Daytime ham radio bands open today. Voice 2017. Possible short openings on 15. We don't have a big MUF, but it's possible. I don't think there'll be very much. You'll hear a lot of data there, though. Data will be good 30 to 10. Nighttime ham band openings 160, 80, 75, 60, 40, 30. 100% chance of 20 open tonight, but it will only work about an hour before sunset, I mean, after sunset, and it's going to just fade away. Just will not have enough juice from the sun today. Shortwave band today, 31, 25, 22, and 19. At the nighttime shortwave bands, 120, 90, 75, 60, 49. 41, 31, 25, 22, and 19 till about an hour past sunset. The difference between 19 and 20 meters, so 19 you know, is basically just a little bit you know, lower than 20 in frequency, but the difference you can really see is very similar. We're losing them earlier in the evening because it's summertime, and it's towards the end of summer in North America, you know, Northern Hemisphere, so not as much charging of the ionosphere. All right, let's take a look at your answers here for the trivia question. Trivia question today is... Not too hard, I don't think. I don't think it is. In what year did Samuel Morse apply for his patent on the printing telegraph? Was it A, 1837, B, 1844, C, 1849, or D, the printing telegraph was not patented by Samuel P. Morse? Now, wouldn't it be a shame if she gave you a question like that, right? If I did that, it just wouldn't be right. So currently in North America with one, the rest of the field is out there with zero, and then Ishmael comes in with B, and B is the correct answer, Ish. Well done. Islands on the air with one. North America with one. Hang in there, Europe. You'll, you'll get back in the game. You always do. So congratulations, Ishmael, over in Dominica for getting it right today. Well done. And yes, there is some good stuff out of Bletchley Park. It is. It is a place that the Enigma Code was cracked. It's it's just a very special place. So if you have a chance to go see Bletchley, you should. It's a pretty cool place. All right. So let's take a look at the rest of your comments. Martin is here. Papa Echo 9, Tango India Golf, reporting for duty, mate. Had to start a PC again. Some ISP issues. Welcome to the show, man. It's good to see you, Martin. As always, 
Thank you for being here from Holland. I appreciate it very, very much. My goodness. And yes, Martin, yep, Bletchley Park cracked the Enigma Code in World War II. It is quite amazing. All right, very good. And yes, Ishmael, with a good point, gets DX all night on 40. 40 will work DX winter, spring, summer, fall. It does. But your best DX in the summer will be on 20. That's where most experienced hams are going to be because the distance is there, because the ionosphere is charged up. It's pretty cool. Try 20 meters tonight. You might be surprised. Okay, we're going to talk today about helping people get into ham radio. That's really the passion here. 21 so far in the very first year of the show, and I'm so humbled by that and grateful that I want to thank you for watching. Today's show is going to be dedicated to folks who might want to get into amateur radio. You know, people, we were all there, right? We started once when we were DXing. You know, we picked up a radio like this and we were listening, you know, to the shortwave bands. And then we heard some warbly noise, found out it was ham radio operators. Today is a show where I hope we can help you, if you'd like to get into amateur radio, to get in amateur radio. It's going to be devoted basically to you. Now, some of the start will be similar to show 250, but we'll spread off very shortly. So hang in there. First of all, talking about diodes and resistors and different schematic elements. These things can really freak people out. And really, they will be on your test. It's part of knowing about ham radio. But don't worry about it. We'll give you some tips to help you, okay? First of all, a diode. A diode is a triangle that goes to a point. Now, it'll either go to a straight line or it will go to maybe a Z like this. Take a look. It's on the general exam, but it can be on the technician as well. Which symbol in figure G71 represents a Zener diode? It's number five. You see the triangle, and instead of going to a straight line, it goes to a lazy Z. Remember the lazy Z, and you've got a Zener diode. Remember, a diode looks normally like this, with a straight line. But here in number five, it's a lazy Z. That's what makes it work. Resistors. If you take a look on the schematic, it's going to look like this. Up and down, up and down, up and down straight. Look at this schematic. You can see all the resistors on it. This will be on your test. Know what a resistor looks like. That will help you, okay? We've talked about diodes a little bit, all right? Diodes triangle to a point. But there's also light Emitting diodes, remember LEDs, they look like this. So a normal diode on top, light emitting diode has arrows coming out of it. It's either going to be straight arrows, or they might have a little bit of a squiggly arrow to it, but it's going to be an LED. That's how you can tell them. Transistors, remember, circle with a T, always the same. Circle, and you have a T inside of it. That's a transistor. Your capacitors, we typically see polarized and variable capacitors in ham radio. So straight line with kind of a lazy C. That'll help you maybe. No, it's a capacitor. Transformers. Remember, I hate to say it, I know you guys are doing it with me, Pop-Tarts in a toaster. Looks like two toaster elements on the side with a couple Pop-Tarts inside. Remember, Pop-Tarts in a toaster equal transformer. Inductors kind of look the same, but they don't have the Pop-Tarts, right? They just kind of go up and down, up and down, up and down. If you see this, remember, inductors are needed to help bring in signals, okay? It's part of an antenna system. Inductance helps to bring in signals. So look at how everything kind of comes in. Remember, inductor, everything goes in, all right? Battery. Now, oftentimes you won't see the plus and minus sign, but this is what it looks like. If you look on schematics, you'll see that most will not show this. Take a look. If you look carefully at this schematic here all right and you look for the power where you know where in the heck is the power here right all right you're not seeing what you would see normally in the schematic instead at the top right you see plus dc okay so you're not seeing a battery here okay but you might not see plus and minus but you'll see a long line and then a space and then a narrower line the longer line is always your positive the smaller line is your negative, okay? Vacuum tubes. You may not have this on your technician exam. It, a, a cathode is always the bottom. A plate, always the top. Electrons flow from the cathode at racing speed. It's a vacuum. So the electrons flow really fast up to the plate. Now, there's a way to control it. That's with grids. Your screen and control grid, they're what help to control 
the speed and the amount of electrodes that go from the electrons that go from your cathode to your plate. So you may not see this piece on your ham radio exam, but if you do, you know it's a tube or a valve in the UK. All right. Grounds. You see here are the different types of grounds. Chassis ground, earth ground, or signal grounds. Let's go back to the schematic. Take a look at the grounds. They're shaped like forks. Those would be earth grounds. Remember, take a look here. Sorry, chassis grounds. You see how they have the M like a fork? There you go. There's your grounds. And you won't have to worry about naming what kind of ground it is. You won't worry about that. ICs, probably not going to be there, but they're giant rectangles and they just have a lot of entries in them. You probably won't see that. You will see this. This is an antenna. Remember, kite antenna. Antennas go up in the air. Kites fly. Put this with a kite and you'll always remember to antenna. Pretty simple. Schematics don't have to be hard. All you do is find a way to remember each one. Once you do that, you should be just fine. But remember the basic stuff. Now, how in the heck do we do this? How does ham radio work? It works off the ionosphere if we're talking HF. All right, only HF. Because HF is going to bounce off of the different layers of the ionosphere. That's how it works. The daytime, we have the D, E, F1, and F2. That's daytime. The D layer absorbs everything, and it's the most charged of all the layers. When I say it absorbs, it'll absorb frequencies from about 7 megahertz down. Okay, so 7 down to the AM down in your car, really. So this is where you're really not going to get much distance during the daytime from the D layer because it's taken most of the signal. If you go above the D layer, okay, you're getting the E and F, you need to be on a higher frequency, all right? The reason why is because on lower frequencies, the frequencies are Short, so are longer. They're longer, and so what happens is they get absorbed by the e, by the sorry, by the D layer so much because there's so much width between the wavelengths. The D layer has enough, you know, attenuation in it, which means to cover or blanket. Okay, that it's going to limit how much of that energy gets bounced back to Earth. That's the reason why when you go to 20 meters, the wavelength is shorter it gets more compact. That's why it punches through to the E, F, and F2. That's why. Now at night on HF, we have only two layers. We have a weakened E layer and a very strong F layer. This is where we make great calls. Now, how in the heck does it work? Our signals essentially skip off the layers, okay? We come off of a transmitter, whether it be on a wire, could be on a tower, could be on a directional beam, okay? And that's going to bounce up off the ionosphere, hit the ground, and sometimes it will come back, okay? It'll come back, hit the ionosphere again, and go down, okay? It's multi-skip. Now, that's how HF works. HF uses the ionosphere. Remember, the D layer absorbs signals, 7 megahertz and lower. So you go 7 to 160 they're, they're attenuated. They have a hard time going far, you know, during the day. At night, 40, 160, 80, 75, those do great. They really do because the D layer is gone at night. They hit the E layer and the F layer, no problem. So during the nighttime, we can use those frequencies and go long distance. But in the daytime, we're going to use 20. We're going to use 17 if it's available, 15 if it's available. Those are the frequencies will get us long distance. So during the daytime, we're going to use those because those frequencies have enough short frequency to them. I mean, they're they're you know they're compact more that they'll get through that D layer and actually hit the E and F1 and F2 because those layers reflect our ham radio signals. That's how it works. Our signals hit the E or F1 or F2 or on the dark side, the E or F layer and bounce back to Earth, okay? If we're lucky, they might bounce over this ocean. And remember, the ocean has salt. Ionization, again, it's going to bounce a signal back up. A signal going over salt water is a brilliant thing because the signal will come back nearly at full power. That's how we get long-distance skip with only 100 watts of power, all right? We also have a thing called the e-skip. E-skip's a little different. Think of the ionosphere, and you remember they got the E layer, right? 
Okay. When we're talking about eSkip, eSkip is kind of like condensed clouds that we don't see because, again, we're talking about the ionosphere. You can't see anything in the ionosphere. It's just there. These are ionized particles that are charged by solar radiation. Okay, so e-skip is condensed clouds. Think of almost like thunder clouds that form that we can't see, but our signals hit them and they bounce off of them. That's a fantastic thing that happens to us in the summer. It also can happen for a short time around the solstices and the winter time. All right, that's how it works. E-skip is highly condensed particles of ions in the e-layer that bounce signals. Because remember, all the ionospheric layers, except for D, bounce our signals. That's how it works, okay? One thing as well, when you take a look, you'll see areas between where these come down. And this will be on your ham radio test. The skip zone. What is a skip zone? A skip zone is the area between where the transmitter takes off with the signal and bounces off the ionosphere and comes back to Earth. If you're in the middle of that area where it's going up to the ionosphere, you're in the skip zone. You won't hear that signal. But somebody maybe 500 miles away from you will, because by then the signal has come back down to Earth again. That's why that works that way. You see, skip zone is something to know in the ham radio test, because it's going to be in the test for you. So, HF bounces off the ionosphere. That's how we use it, okay? But what about VHF and UHF? In the old days, if you were if you're old enough to remember television when we had the old VHF and UHF dials, we you know would turn to different stations. They were on different frequencies. It's important to know simply where those frequencies are because there's really only three you got to deal with. You only got to deal with three. Okay, we deal with high frequency, so that's HF. That's going to be three megahertz to thirty megahertz. This is a simple thing for you to remember. I promise. High frequency very high frequency and ultra high frequency are the only ones you have to worry about. The good thing is they go in threes. So let me help you with it. High frequency, three to 30 megahertz. Okay. So three to 30, 30 to 300 is VHF. So 30 to 300 VHF, 300 to three gigahertz is UHF. Okay. So start again, three to 30 HF. 30 to 300 VHF, 300 to 3 gigahertz or 3,000 megahertz is UHF. Simple to remember. Starts with 3, goes to 30, goes to 300, then goes to either 3 gigahertz or 3,000 megahertz. And you have it. Okay? It's pretty simple to remember. And having this is very, very important because it will be on your test. And another thing to keep in mind as well, is when you're talking about bands, sometimes they'll mention, you know, like what band are you on if you're at this frequency, okay? You might have a difficult time knowing what that is. If you take the number 300 and you divide it by the frequency, you'll get the meter band every time, okay? So, and, and I need to tell you, first of all, this may not work brilliantly every time for you. But it's a, this is the formula to figure out what meter band. 300 divided by your frequency. So say, for example, they give you what meter band if your, if your radio shows you're on a frequency of 7.128 are you at? All right? You'll take 300, divide it by 7.128, and it's going to give you somewhere close to 40 meters. But it won't be 40. It won't. It'll be close. Keep in mind... On 40, 20, and 17 meters, we use those from a historical perspective. They're not mathematically accurate. 80, 75 are, 160 is, but not 40, 80, sorry, 40, 17, and 20. They just aren't, but they're close. So if you get one of those and you see 41.296, and one of the answers is 40 meters, pick 40 meters. That's how you do it. So remember, when you use that frequency formula, 300 divided by the megahertz equals the meter band. It will work every single time. All right. Now, we got different types of modulation. The smallest is digital. That uses the least amount of bandwidth. Next comes Morse code. It takes five, I'm sorry, 50 hertz, just 50, 50 hertz of signal. That's it. Next comes sideband. That takes up 
we think three. Here it says 2.8, but in your test, sideband will be three, okay? Lower sideband is going to run you from your frequency, whatever your radio says, down three kilohertz. That's it. So say you're on uh, 40 meters and you're at 7.220, okay? Your signal is going to go from 7.220 to 7.217. It goes down three kilohertz. If you're on upper sideband, all right, and you're on 20 meters, remember the dividing line is 10 megahertz. Remember 10. Anything below 10 megahertz is lower sideband. Anything lower is lower sideband. Anything above 10 megahertz, upper sideband. That's how you remember them, okay? 10 megahertz is your dividing line. Once you have that, you'll have it all figured out. Lower sideband goes there, below 10. Upper sideband goes above 10. One exception, 60 meters. Okay, 60 meters, unfortunately, when it was first developed by the military, they used upper sideband. So 60 meters is the one exception to the rule, and this might be on the test, of lower sideband below 10 megahertz. Remember, 60 meters is always upper sideband. All right, so remember, upper and lower sideband, they're the next lowest method of transmission after CW, Morse code. Morse code CW, right? So upper and lower. Now, AM takes those two sidebands and puts a carrier in the middle. I've always told you bologna sandwich, same thing. Carrier in the middle, lower sideband, then upper sideband. You've got AM. It takes six kilohertz. It's six kilohertz wide. Next width goes bigger is FM. It's why it sounds so beautiful, because if you've got 12 kilohertz of bandwidth, you can put a ton of fidelity in that. That's why 12 kilohertz is used for FM. So you need to know what these are, AM, how it works. Remember, carrier with upper and lower sideband. If you remove the carrier and one sideband, you've got sideband. Either it's lower or it's upper. The small one going to be Morse code, also known as CW. All right. So we know that very well. Also, your band plan, very important to know. Whether you're in region one, two, or three in the US and South America and Canada, we are in region two. So take a look at your band plan. Know where you can transmit. This is really important. It's not hard either. I know there's a ton here. Okay. So throw out for the most part 23 centimeters, 33 centimeters, 70 centimeters. And, and just focus, for the most part here, on, you're going to focus on 80, 40, 20, and you're going to focus a little bit on, till, on 17, 15, 12, 10, and 6. But those are easy to memorize. Geez, they're not that big. So just remember, that's the best way to remember. Don't worry about 1.25 meters or 70 sams or anything, because they're not going to be on your test. They're a way you can transmit. Sure, you can use those to transmit, but they're not going to be on your test. That's the main thing. All right. Quickly, hellos. Will Myers, Kilo Alpha, Golf India, Mike, welcome. Happy Sunday, my friend. It's so great to see you. Truly is, as well as Tom. And I don't mean to bore you guys. I don't. Yeah, 300 is the magical ham number. It really is. Uh, you guys all know this. My hope is somebody watches this that wants to learn and get into ham radio. With this... Hopefully, a little supplemental help to your test primer, which is your, you know, your online test course or maybe a book, you'll pass your test. This is stuff to help you remember just to keep it here, okay? Super heterodyne. It's simple, okay? There are six stages. Your RF amplifier and tuner. Now, see up top, you got the kite? There you go. Then it goes to a mixer, which combines the local oscillator, which is a crystal. It's at a set frequency, Okay. Local oscillator combines with the RF amplifier and tuning stage, mixes everything together, and forms an intermediate frequency. That goes in the next box. That's your IF amp and filter. From there, it demodulates the signal, goes into an amplifier, and out your speaker. Simple. SDRs, totally different. Antenna goes into an A to D converter, so analog to digital. From there, it goes into some encryption and some network routing. And basically, it helps to provide the information necessary for the field programmable gate array, which is on the top right, the big box. That's where, your, that's where all your filters are. You know, your bandwidth, your notch, your digital noise reduction. 
keeping you on frequency, what frequency you're on, everything. Then when it goes out, it goes out to a D to A converter. Because again, we're, we're transmitting analog. So we're transmitting an analog signal. So it has to go digital to analog. Then it goes out to your antenna. Okay, pretty simple. Remember those two. Software-defined radios means that a computer basically runs the radio. Okay, a super retrodyne radio is a crystal oscillator powered radio. Keeps you on frequency. That's how it works. By the way, welcome Greg. It's always good to see you, Greg. Kilo Fox Zero, Charlie Union Zulu. It's an honor. Happy Sunday, Greg. Happy Sunday. All right. We're almost done. Then we'll have a little talk about some stuff. FCC, here's some tests. Now, you need to know the rules, and the rules are simple. What's proof of possession of an FCC license? Okay? Your license has to appear on the FCC ULS database. Okay? So once it appears in the FCC ULS database, you're good. Okay, and this is how it's going to appear exactly on your test. You'll know you've got your license when it shows up on the FCC database, right? How long is your term? Your term in the U.S. is 10 years. In the U.K., five, okay? So how long is a normal term for an FCC-issued primary station operator amateur radio grant? This is a $50 question. Here's, let's break it down. How long does your license last? 10 years. That's it. Just 10. All right. Well, on secret codes, there are lots of variations of this. When's it permissible to transmit messages encoded to hide their meaning? The answer, only when transmitting control commands to space station or radio controlled craft. Remember, only transmitted codes that are, you know, not able to be decoded are to things, not to people. If it's a code to people, it cannot be encoded that people don't know what it means. Simple. That's all it is. So remember, if you're controlling a thing, it's permissible. If you're not, then it's not permissible. What's part 97 rule of a space station? Remember, an Earth station is 50 kilometers or less in altitude. An, an space station, 50 kilometers or higher. So 50 kilometers is the dividing line. If you're below it, you're an Earth station. If you're above it, you're a space station. What about RF exposure? In RF exposure, what we're talking about here is our antennas create radio frequency, interfer not interference, but radiation. Basically, they radiate radio frequency out, okay? We want to make sure that we don't hurt our neighbors that are close by with too much radio frequency exposure. So, there are ways to make sure we can do that. Number one, by calculation based on FCC OET Bulletin 65. Number two, by calculation based on computer modeling, which you can do like EasyNex software, something you can find on the internet for free. Easy to do, right? C, by measurement of field strength using calibrated equipment. You can use a field strength meter to find out if you're, you know, if you're good. So all of these choices work. It's perfect. What about expired license? Remember, 10 years is your term. 10 years in the U.S., Five in the UK. The answer is you cannot transmit unless the FCC license database shows that your license has been removed, uh, renewed, excuse me, renewed. So remember, you have to make sure your license has been renewed so you can transmit. If it hasn't and it's expired, you can't. And here's a question they love more than, you know, a fat kid loves. I can't say that joke. Sorry. All right. All right so what, <laughs> under what condition... Is an amateur station authorized to transmit music using a phone emission? And they do this a million different ways. It is the most unique set of circumstances ever. It's only when incidental to an authorized retransmission, which is the first weird part, of manned spacecraft communication. So you'd have to have you'd have to have permission from the astronaut to replay it on your ham radio station. By, you know, by the way, hey Bill over across town, check this out. I just contacted the ISS. Listen. And you go and you retransmit, right? And it's got music in the background. It's because the astronaut had a radio on up at the ISS. That's it. It's such a weird darn question, but it appears all over the test, whether technician, extra, or general. Under what conditions is an amateur station authorized to transmit music? The answer is never. Really, never. Unless you're talking to an astronaut. 
and they allow you to retransmit it, and music's playing in the background, and the refrigerator temperature is 34 degrees, and it's a sunny day. It's just crazy. So that question will come up. Uh, just remember, it's authorized retransmission of manned spacecraft, and you'll be fine. It's just a weird, weird question that keeps going on. All right. Impedance. Impedance is something that we deal with, especially with our antennas. Because antennas are by nature resistant. Resistance, impedance, they're brothers. They work together, okay? So impedance is important for us to know in ham radio because we want the most power to go out of our radio to our antenna, right? Impedance is what we want to work with. That's the electrical principle. All right, so in this question, what reading on a SWR, remember SWR means standing wave ratio meter, indicates a perfect impedance match between the antenna and feed line. We all know the answer. It's one to one. But someone who's not in ham radio would not know this. They would have no idea what this means. Remember, antennas are naturally resistant. They're, they're just resistant, period. We work with impedance then because impedance and resistance are the same thing. We want our radio to be happy with our antenna. So a one-to-one -one match means everything is perfect. Yeah, there's resistance to the antenna, but the radio can handle it because the antenna has been built to the proper frequency, all right? And that frequency, if you want to know what it is, in the U.S., it's 468 divided by frequency. That's how you build an antenna. That's a half-wave antenna. So 468 divided by whatever frequency you want. You want a 40-meter antenna, divide, you know, 468 divided by 7.225 to be in the middle of the voice portion. It'll tell you how long your antenna needs to be. Okay, so 468 divided by that, and you get a wonderful impedance match that your antenna and your radio are going to be happy with. And please, one other thing. We all have tuners on our radio. It says the tune button, right? <laughs> They're not antenna tuners. They're called tutors, but really they're impedance matchers. They're trying to find a, a logical calculation of impedance match between the radio and that antenna. That's all they do, period. Even an external tuner does the exact same thing. Can we find something that will match? If it does, you'll be great. And one other thing, you will learn a million times more about ham radio once you get in. You will. You just have to pass the initial test. Practical knowledge is worth five times more, in my opinion, than this knowledge. It is. You just have to pass the test. But once you do, you get on the radio and you start gaining experience. And, and this is really good from Gunter. Experience comes with blown fuses, burned up wires, and fired up coils. He's right. It's from, you know, pushing the envelope. It's from making mistakes. Your best... Uh, your best, uh, sorry, I'm trying to think of the word. Sorry, guys. Your best teacher in life is the mistakes. They are. It's just a brilliant teacher for you. So don't be afraid to make mistakes. Don't be afraid to make an antenna the wrong length. Don't be afraid to make your mistakes because those mistakes will teach you. And, and experience with using a ham radio is so important because you will get so much more out of it. All right. Another thing that you need to know. All right. What's the formula to calculate electrical power in a DC circuit? Welcome, by the way, to Hats Stuff. Hats Stuff, happy Sunday to you, my friend. Thank you for being here. It's an honor. First time. First time. That's cool. All right. The formula you use to calculate electrical power in a DC circuit is very easy. And you can do this, folks. You can. Power equals voltage multiplied by current. Okay. So we want to find out power. Power is voltage, okay? So if, say for example, we want to know what the voltage is of a, of a circuit, right? We have current, which is I, and resistance, which is R. They can't put C for current because that's capacitance. So VIR, remember this pyramid. Take it in with you, in your head. Write it down on a piece of paper. It'll help you to take a look at questions to know the answer like this. What's the current through a 100-ohm resistor connected across 200 volts? Okay, so now we know we're talking about we want current. We know there's a 100-ohm resistor and there's 200 volts. Okay, so we've got our voltage. We have our resistance. 
So for our answer, we're going to divide, right? So 100, because remember, voltage is on the top. 100 divided by 200, because remember, resistance on the bottom equals 2. That's how you do it. If you know this formula, this simple VIR formula, it will help you on math questions that you might be afraid of. Because here's one from the technician, and there's probably a dozen or so more just like it. Okay, Wavelength. How does the wavelength of a radio wave relates to a frequency? Now, its frequency gets shorter as the wavelength increases. That's how it works. So, when you're on 17 meters, much shorter than you are on 40. Much shorter. And MPE limits can be affected as well. So that's how it works. Remember, 300 divided by whatever frequency you're on equals your meter band. Simple way to remember. All right. Another test question from the technician. When do the FCC rules not apply to the operation of an amateur station? The answer is simple. Never. FCC rules always apply. All right. What about things like this? Which Q signal indicates you're receiving interference from other stations? QRM. It's QR man-made. It's from other stations. Remember, other stations are run by people. If you remember these things, QRM, QR man-made, B, QRN, QR environment, environmental noise. That's static, natural noise in the atmosphere. That's what comes on a radio. QTH, that means home. That's your home, where your location is. QT, home. QSB, Q signal bad. That's how I remember that. QSB means there's fading in the signal. The signal is not stable. How I remembered Q signal bad. QSB means fading. Okay. You can know the Q codes and get to know them better, which will help you. But it's it's easier to try and put them together. For example, look at this. You see QRS. Shall I say more slowly? Remember, Q, receive slowly. QRT looks like quit. QSL, received and understood. Okay, find different ways you can use Q codes because you might have one pop up on your test. Here's another one. It pops up everywhere. It really does. General, technician, extra. And it, it's, it'll be on your test. I can almost guarantee you. Which of the following restrictions apply when a non-licensed person is allowed to speak to a foreign nation, or sorry, foreign station, using a station under the control of a technician control operator? All right. So we've got like a, you know, a $90 question here. And it's, it should be simple. The answer is, when can someone else come use your ham radio and talk to someone in a different country? That's it. That's it. The question broken down. That's the whole thing. That's it. The answer, the foreign station must be one with which the U.S. has a third-party agreement. Okay? The good news is there's not any countries where we don't. It's true. No one has informed the United Nations that we don't want to hear from amateur radio operators in our country. So we're good. All right? Last question. Okay. What's the impact of using too much effective radiated power on a satellite uplink? All right, and this will come up because you'll be able to talk to the International Space Station with a technician license. They want you to understand the you know, responsibilities you have. If you use too much power to talk to a satellite, you could block access by other users on the downlink side. That's how it works. So make sure your power up to the satellite isn't too much. Make sure it's just enough to make the contact. If you do that, then other users can enjoy the satellite and use it as well. All right, now... A couple more things to help with, and we'll be done. Waterfall. This is a general question, but it will come up on the technician. Which of the following designs, sorry, describes a waterfall display? All right? So we're just talking a simple little waterfall, and we're trying to get an idea of what it is. Horizontal is your frequency. Your signal strength is intensity. Okay? Intensity is the part on the top of the waterfall. And then time is vertical. Let's take a look at it. On this radio, which is live here on, tw on uh, 20 meters, here is your frequency. It runs 100, where are we at? Yeah, 100 kilohertz now. Okay, so we're here. This is your frequency, side to side. So it's horizontal, all right? Your field, uh, sorry, your strength, your signal strength is intensity. That's all these little bouncing lines up top. See the intensity? That's intensity right there. There's a signal here, okay? There's time. That's your signal right there, okay? Here's another signal right here, okay? So this is, again, looking at this question. 
Frequency is horizontal. You see how frequency goes side to side? That'd be, you know, what's receivable by the radio right now. Such the frequencies available. You can see them on the bottom. All right. Signal strength is intensity. That's a bouncing up and down part. That's your intensity. Okay. Time is vertical. Okay. Time is the part where you see here's a person talking and there it is going down the waterfall. That's the reason why it's called a waterfall. That's why we call them waterfall displays. All right. That's it. I think you got it. As long as you remember the formulas, okay? V over IR, triangle is important. Know how the meters are working, how the meter bands work. 300 divided by your frequency. You'll be good. Understand how HF works differently than UHF, VHF. This part is really important, all right? HF bounces off the ionosphere. VHF and UHF are point to point. So it's got to be line of sight, roughly 11 miles or so unless it goes through a repeater. Now remember, a repeater takes a signal and repeats it out. Farther, it increases the distance of our VHF or UHF radios because a repeater allows it to go farther. It repeats the signal. Now, you might see also something that talks about offset when it comes to repeaters. Offset is the difference between the transmit frequency and the receive frequency. That's offset, okay? And it can be different for different repeaters, but offset means the difference between transmit and receive on repeaters. Also, try and remember a little bit of those Q codes, and I think you got this. You really do. If you remember the VIR pyramid, remember 300 divided by frequency, remember the rules. It's very important. And also, don't be afraid to go to some classes. They're good. ARL will help you. They've got great distance learning, my friends. You can go to another school, like maybe Ham School. This is right from the comfort of your home. Ham School Radio Online, plus Ham Radio Prep, or maybe you're going to do Ham Test Online. All of those will help you tremendously. They really will. They're great opportunities for you to learn and grow in Ham Radio. All right? Before we go, I want to share something with you, because this is cool. This is now we're talking, let's go on to something that's really cool that you need to know about that's ham radio related. Okay. I've had a chance to work with this. This is the Alpha Antenna Hextenna, and I've had a chance to work and really work hard on this antenna. This will work you literally anything you want. If you want HF, it'll work HF. You want to work VHF, It'll work VHF. You want to work UHF? It will work UHF out of this carbon fiber box. I mean, it's just amazing. This thing is solid as a rock, literally. I mean, this is probably a pound. It just, it's indestructible, all right? And, and literally, it's simple. What I love about this antenna is it's simple as heck to use. It shows you on the antenna where the different segments are that you're going to plug in. You just simply put those segments on. And the magic in it is in how far you extend the whip. Okay? So you have your whip, and these go to about 17, 18 feet, and they're very well built, very solid construction. You simply go, and say, for example, you want to use it as you can use it as a dipole because it comes with two. So you, you screw it in here, and you screw the other end in to the other dipole section, which is right here. Now you've got a dipole. Okay? Or maybe you want a vertical. Here's where you're going to use it for VHF, UHF. Okay? You're going to plug it into the vertical element, which is perfectly placed because if you're going to use this, you're going to want a tripod. Okay? The tripod connects right there. It's brilliant. So your VHF, UHF is right here. Literally, this one piece, see how it looks like you know your ham stick at home that you work two meters or 440 on? the same thing you just and they tell you how far to extend it and you now have a uhf vhf antenna so maybe you want to work 40 okay because it will work 20 when you extend these all the way and you run it through the dipole consider thing configuration it'll work you 20 all day long and what's great when you're working on a tripod you can rotate the dipole okay so let's say you've got here on one of the dipoles okay and you've got you know both whips in and this is great this thing what I love about this product, and this is, again, the Alpha Antenna Hextenna, it is brilliantly easy. I love easy. Easy to me is the best because 
Easy means I don't have to put up a whole bunch of time and I can get the thing up. You can have this up in two minutes. Literally, take a look at what the link's supposed to be of the whip, cook it up to the tripod, which is optional, but worth every penny. It's the best ham radio tripod I've ever wanted to use, and I will use it from now on. You you hook it together, and let's say you want to work 40. Okay. If you want to work 40... Sorry about that. I didn't realize it flipped off the table there. You work 40, you extend this out all the way, you clip it to the antenna, and then you just hook it up on the ground. You now have a 40-meter antenna. Or flip it up into a tree. It just clips onto the antenna. This is brilliant. It is brilliant. And the other thing that's really cool is they have a directional kit for this. If you put this together as a directional, what you get is you get a bar. So imagine, okay, you've got your pieces coming out on a V, right? So typical dipole. All right. So you would hook up the hextena piece to your base, okay? You now have a rod, which is so cool. You have a rod that connects the two sections that go out, so the two V sections. You then just rotate this thing, and it's going to work as a directional antenna for you, and you just work wherever you want to go. It works as a true directional. The one end is going to be slightly shorter than the other because that's where your director and your reflectors are going to be. So one way and then the other, you're good. This thing is brilliant. What's What I love about it is it's simple. And Thor, you're right. We need to probably put the woofing filter on, right? Okay. So the Alpha Hex Tenna. I loved the Chameleon. I, the Chameleon was pretty simple, right? 100 watts. This is 1,500 watts. You can go full power on this thing. So far, this antenna has blown me away. Totally blown my mind. The ingenuity, the simplicity, and what it can do are astounding. I mean, really, for a go bag to be as light as what this one is and to do everything, VHF, UHF, HF, and directionality on HF, there's nothing out there that competes with it. Alpha Antenna Hex Tenna. One of the coolest antennas I have ever owned, and I love this thing. So take a look at it, alphaantennas.com. You'll find it, the Alpha Hex Tenna is what it is. I still need to test it on uh, VHF and UHF. That's it, and it's cool. We've got the video of me doing it, using it, and how it works. And folks, I got to tell you, I it's this is one I love because it's simple. All right, all right. We're gonna get some quick goodbyes to y'all, and thank you for being here. And Martin, bless his heart. If you're good looking at this because you're new to Am Radio, this is great. Martin Pacman Echo 9 Tango Mini Golf. Electronics works on smoke. It's true. We all say it's smoke, really. And the reason why is because as long as the smoke doesn't come out our stuff, it means it's going off the antenna. That's a good thing. Martin says electronics works on smoke. If smoke comes out, it no, it no longer works. <laughs> there you go. Fly. Yeah, exactly. Well done, Martin. That's right. <laughs> Al Gross is here. Al, you emailed me today. Gosh, it was great to hear from you. I hope things are okay for you in Pennsylvania. Whiskey Bravo Zero, Alpha Lima. Al, my best senior wife. Great to have you, man. Wow. Sean is here. East the Cascades. Alpha India 7, Echo Quebec, my friend. It's great to see you, mate, from east of the Cascades. VK Radio Ham is in the house. Victor Kilo 3, Golf Echo Kilo. It's great to see you, mate. How are you? You know, I know this show's not for everybody. I get it. But it's not supposed to be. You know, this is about helping people get on Ham Radio. This show is about starting people. Like, we all started one time, Remember? This show is dedicated to those people that are starting, and I hope it helps you. Remember, I'm not a substitute for your study. I can give you ideas, but you really should learn, okay? Go to a ham school or to a ham club and learn from them, and then take your test. Hopefully, there's some things that I presented that will help you pass your test. The main thing is we want you here. We want you to join this hobby because it is the coolest hobby ever. Ever. So thank you very much for being a part of this. Let's scoot along and say goodbye until next time. God bless you.
Thanks for all the kind emails, the kind words, everything you have said. Weeks are very difficult for me right now because there are so many appointments for Bob. But believe me, my heart's in this, and I miss not seeing you guys. So when I see Gunter and I see people like Sean, I see Tom, I see Martin, VK Radio Ham, all of you guys, I, I mean it when I say thank you because I think of you, and I am so honored you come. Until next time. My name's Larry. My call sign's Kilo 7 Hotel November. Congratulations to Ishmael for getting the trivia question right today. Until we meet again, thank you for coming to Ham Radio Live. God bless you wherever you may be in this world. I hope you enjoy this uh, sign-off. It's actually closed down. This is this is one from Hungary. We, we do celebrate Ham Radio, but we celebrate broadcasting here too. This is the end of a broadcast day if you were in Hungary back in the day. And it's one of the most beautiful ones we've ever done. Until then, goodbye, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. We've got Kel back. And I swore that when I saw Kel pop up on the screen, I was going to say hello to Norway. Kel joins us from Norway, and he has three times, and I haven't done the honor of saying hello to you in Norway. Kel, thank you for coming. Liba Bravo Zero, Yankee, India. I mean this when I say thank you. Thank you, my friend. All right. So you have to close down. Close down again is from radio, sorry, television in Budapest. This is from radio, sorry, tel, wow, I'm done talking. Television in Hungary. Till then, God bless you and goodbye, everybody. I know what you're thinking, punk. You're thinking, did he fire six shots or only five? Now, to tell you the truth, I forgot myself and all this excitement.